NSC just released a federal agenda for President-elect Biden and the next Congress. So can you tell all of us about that agenda for inclusive recovery and also how NSC plans to make it real? Sure. Thanks, Rachel. And good afternoon or good morning, everybody. It was really great to have you here. Um, Rachel, before I get to the agenda, let me just I think I just want to kind of level set a little bit about, you know, what it is that we're facing today as a nation in terms of our economy and the pandemic, because I think the importance of this agenda, I know this has obviously been a big week. Um, we know that we're just getting the final pieces of a huge national election that I know we're going to be talking a lot about and about how the outcomes of that election are going to impact an agenda that NSC released this week to try to make sure that everybody can be part of the economic recovery coming out of this recession. Um, but it just so happens that this is Thursday. So Thursday morning is the morning when the unemployment numbers come out. So just to, to kind of reflect on that. So this morning, they reported that another 709,000 folks made an initial claim for unemployment. So that's the 34th week in a row that we've had more initial claims filed than any week, even the worst week during the 2009 recession. So we've got three times as many people who are getting unemployment now as 10 years ago when we last had a recession of this size. Um, and within those numbers, there's probably, uh, there's over 400,000 folks who just this past week basically ran out of unemployment insurance out of their state unemployment insurance. And some of them are gonna be able to get federal extensions on that unemployment insurance. About 160,000 of them were able to get on to the emergency extension but that runs out next month. Like unless Congress takes some action, all of those folks who are losing their unemployment insurance, they're not even gonna have a federal uh, backstop for helping them out. So, you know, the urgency of action by Washington on these issues could not be overstated. We have 21, over 21 million people who are receiving unemployment insurance. There's others, you know, a million plus people or more who've already just dropped out of the labor market altogether who are not even qualifying for unemployment. We have 4 million people who have been on unemployment for uh, over six months. So these are long-term unemployed folks that the only way they're likely to get back into the labor market, many of them are not gonna be going back to the jobs that they had. The only way that they're gonna be going back is if we are doing something as a field, if we are doing something as a country to invest in their education and training and reemployment to get them back into the labor market, into a job that can support them and can support their families. Um, you know, so those are devastating numbers. It's devastating for those households. It's devastating for the nation's economy. Most economists don't think we're going to get back to pre-pandemic employment levels until at least 2022. But it's a burden that is disproportionately being borne by groups of working people who are not doing very well before the pandemic. Low wage workers, workers of color, particularly women of color, a range of different working people who don't have a college degree and never really got a chance to get any kind of education or training past high school to put them into a better uh, paying career. They're the ones who are uh, concentrated in the sectors that are most impacted by this recession, retail and hospitality uh, and different parts of food service and, and, uh, and healthcare. Uh, and those are the folks that we feel as we're coming up with an economic recovery strategy, we need to be very focused on them. So NSC had been part of conversations back in 2009 and 2010 about how to help get that economy restarted. But when our organization and our leadership thought about what it is that we should be saying and laying out for this economic recovery, we felt we needed to be much more explicit about who's been left out of past recoveries and who needs to be included in this one. And so the framework that we put out earlier this year, Skills for an Inclusive Economic Recovery, was based on a set of principles that said, like, let's in, invest first in the folks that have, folks have been most impacted by this pandemic. Let's be conscious of how racism has figured into who's been included in past recovery policies. Let's look at our own policies to make sure that it is not recommitting some of the same structural problems that have stopped many people from getting into a good paying career. Uh, let's make sure that we're including the small business community. We have so many small businesses that have been disproportionately impacted by this recession. So let's make sure that they are at the table with other industry partners to figure out what these solutions should be. And let's make sure we're measuring who is being served and who's not being served by these recovery policies that we can pivot and make sure that we're directing them to the people who need them the most. Uh, so that framework was released early this year and this week, National Skills Coalition uh, released two different sets of recommendations 
uh, and uh, uh, Rachel has put them into the chat if you haven't seen them already on our website or received them in our e in email. Two different sets of recommendations. One of them, a sort of a set of short-term recommendations to the uh, to President Biden elects uh, President elect Biden's I'm sorry transition team, uh, which is going to be things that they could be doing by agency, agency structuring, executive action, first hundred day initiatives that they could be doing right away. But there's a broader set of proposals that we put out there and that's some of what we're going to talk about today, which is really kind of like the long term work that's going to have to be done between President Biden and Democrats and Republicans in the 117th Congress. And I know we're going to talk about kind of like what the implications of this election was. There's no question that we have a divided country. We're going to have a divided legislature, regardless of what happens with the outcome of the two Georgia races that we're that we're going to be waiting on. And so the question is, what is it that we as an organization can do to try to move some kind of bipartisan consensus forward and what we should be doing for the working people and the businesses that have been most impacted by this recession? Uh, Vice President Biden uh, says that he wants to build back better and we completely agree, but we feel you can't build back better unless you're including everyone in that recovery. So here's eight different ways that we think Congress and President Biden could be working together to start to address some of those issues. So one, we think that they should, we should come up with a better safety net that supports workers' long-term uh, pathway to a skilled career. So we have a set of recommendations around changes to TANF and SNAP, to childcare and transportation assistance to help people who are struggling to hold down a job and train at the same time and support their families so they can get into something where they can support themselves more effectively. Second, we need a comprehensive approach to rethinking reemployment policy in this country for all dislocated workers, a long overdue 21st century reset. Clearly our unemployment systems weren't ready for the, for the recession that we're currently in. It's not been effective for past recessions and it certainly isn't prepared for the volatility of a future of work where we're gonna have increasing changes in work with digitization and other, and other things that we've talked about in other contexts in terms of a changing labor market of the future. Third, we wanna make sure that publicly funded job creation has hardwired into it training investments to make sure that those who've lost jobs are gonna be among the first who are gonna get the new jobs that we're creating. So whether that's through infrastructure or a rebuilt public health care workforce uh, uh, or whatever it is that we're doing to create jobs uh, at the federal level, we're going to guarantee that there's going to be training for the people who've lost their jobs to get back into some of those new positions. We want to support local businesses to avert layoffs and to better support the retraining of their workforces, something much better than we had through the PPP loans of this past year. We wanna make sure that it's targeted to the businesses and the workforces that need it the most. And that we're not just keeping people on payroll, but we're helping them retool for an economy that's gonna look very different once we come out of this recession. Fifth, we wanna be investing in sector partnerships that are gonna be driving industry specific and hiring strategies, making sure that businesses and labor unions and colleges and community organizations and stakeholders on the ground are gonna figure out what these strategies are gonna be. We're not gonna let Washington pick the winners. We want folks on the ground to figure out what the strategies should be. Sixth, uh, we wanna have digital access and learning for all working people, both at home and on the job. Uh, this was a problem for tens of millions of working Americans before this pandemic, but the current situation has just brought it into stark relief how uh, difficult a situation folks are going to face if they don't have the digital literacy skills, the broadband access, and the equipment that's going to allow them to learn and train at home, to work from home, and even to be using new equipment that is now being introduced into work into workplaces that have their headcounts reduced because of the current pandemic. Seventh, we want high quality job ready education for those who need it to enter the labor market and specifically making college work for working people. And this is a whole set of proposals that we have across a range of different education policies that are gonna meet working people where they are, whether they're out of a job or they're hanging on to a job to make it easy for them to train, advance, earn industry recognized credentials and move on to a good paying job, whether it's with their current employer or with another firm within their industry. And finally, we want public data and accountability so we know who is being served and who is not being included in this recovery. Again, so we can hold these policies accountable and we can hold ourselves accountable as stakeholders and advocates. So that's the agenda. We're gonna talk a little bit more about it. I hope folks will get a chance to read through the document uh, that we distributed earlier this week. Um, one thing I am going to say is that these aren't just good policies from a practical perspective, they are politically popular. We're going to hear a little bit more about that later on in this hour, 
But I just want to make sure that folks understand that political popularity is not going to be enough. We need the voices of everybody who is on this call today and all the networks that are part of National Skills Coalition to be part of how it is that we bring this agenda to Washington's attention over the next couple months. And that includes the local business people who are part of our Business Leaders United Network, uh, the state coalitions that are part of our Skills Span State Network, all of the working people and everyday Americans who have joined our Voices for Skills campaign dating back to the beginning of the 2019-2020 election cycle, and all the rest of the labor unions and community colleges and community organizations and uh, workforce boards and other advocates who are part of NSC's national network. And you're gonna get a chance to hear from representatives from each of those four networks over the course of the rest of this hour. So let me stop there and let me turn things back over to Rachel. I'll be coming back a little bit later to talk a bit about how we're gonna take some of these ideas and put them into action. But I first wanna give Rachel a chance to talk a little bit more about the election itself and what we think it means for the chances for us to actually enact some of these ideas in Washington over the next year or so. All right, thanks, Andy. And I know some folks have asked already in the chat for the documents you referred to, and I have posted links to all of them in the chat box, and you can also find them on our homepage at nationalskillscoalition.org. Um, so I want to turn to our first guest. Uh, my neighbor here in Chicago, Brian Stryker, who's a partner with ALG Research, um, to talk about voter views on skills training and how this issue weighed or didn't weigh in this election cycle. Um, ALG Research, for those of you who have seen uh, NSC's polling in the past, they've done a bit of polling for us. Um, they also did the polling for President-elect Biden this year, so Brian's been a little busy. Um, so, Brian, thanks for being here. Yeah, yeah, happy to be here. Um, so you were polling for candidates in a lot of swing congressional districts this cycle. Um, what did you see in the data um, in, in those districts? And I'm also curious what you typically need to see in data in order to advise a candidate to run on an issue like skills training. So I, I think um, it, it was an issue where we, we looked at it in a lot of districts. And as you know, sort of, uh, we've often had candidates run on it as an issue. And this cycle was no exception. I think of at least two of our candidates uh, who won in Trump districts, uh, Ron Kine and Cindy Axney, both ran uh, TV ads on the issue and sort of talked about it quite a bit. Um, certainly Biden, um, if not, you know, he might not have put skills training forward in, as much as the broader economic agenda, but he certainly talked about the dignity of work, the middle class as a backbone. You know, uh, I think that that uh, it was clearly the economy was a huge issue for voters. And when you look at the exit polls, it was sort of one or two, and sort of depending on how you break it down, and coronavirus and healthcare are up there. But I, I guess the, the things that I see about skills training that led us to go on the air with it, especially in those Trump districts, are one, there's not a lot of partisanship to it. It's not an issue where people think it should be for Democrats or Republicans. And I don't think plenty of Republicans have run on job training and skills training and stuff. Um, two, you can you can get wins on it in policy on the state level a lot of times too, like as we saw in Michigan and have seen in other places. Um, so, uh, you can often talk about successes, like Haley Stevens was able to talk about some like actual policy wins, which is a not a lot of those happening in Congress right now. Um, so, so that was that was big. Um, and and three, I think it it drives the value. I mean, as, as you've seen with polling uh, for you, people people don't want to sit home and get paid nothing, and we all or get paid right. We all know that. Like people want to work, right? That people want to want to be. Uh, contributing, they want to be um, uh, uh, the dignity of work, right? You know, I mean, that's real, and and that speaks to a value that people have, a perception they have of themselves, and the perception they have of the country, which is why I think it can be such an effective issue for people to campaign on, especially when you got something done. So you, we first met you, Brian. Um, after you wrote a memo, it was a little bit in advance of the 2018 election, 
just lifting up all the things you were seeing in focus groups and in polling data um, that seemed to be bubbling up back then, which was that voters were talking about skills training and bringing it up of their own initiative and in, in focus groups. Um, despite that, not a lot of candidates in that cycle were talking about skills training. So what major shift did you see this cycle and, and why do you think those shifts happened? Well, I mean, I think to a large degree, uh, coronavirus certainly dominated the conversation. And that coronavirus is a complicated conversation when it comes to the economies. There's a sort of, do we open up? Do we not? That's not clear. Um, Child care, a huge piece of it, as we know, the sort of gender disparity in, in who's working and who's not. Um, but then I think that voters are just sort of unsure of what the economy looks like coming out of coronavirus, right? And they think it's going to come back. They're not worried about that. They think it's going to come back at some time relatively soon. And they very much understand, okay, there are going to be jobs that are just different, you know, than they were two years ago. Um, and there might need to be people who are sort of trained differently for those jobs. Right? There's some jobs just aren't going to exist in this economy and that process is going to be accelerated by this. Um, but it, it, you know, it was hard to cut through anything but coronavirus in this and as an, as an overall conversation. I mean, when you, you know, but um, at the same time, especially for these folks that are in um, whether Democrats in Trump districts or Republicans in Biden districts, like that was a way to sort of talk across lines to people. Um, and frankly, you saw it uh, with uh, voters of color who were very interested in economic conversation, certainly swung to many Republicans and in many cases at the same time, a lot of white voters swung back to Democrats. All right, so just any final thoughts for folks on this call as they're thinking about um, conversations with their elected officials, whether Democrats or Republicans um, in the coming months, both new and seasoned members of Congress, just in terms of, of what you saw in the data, that what you mentioned about bipartisanship, any advice to folks um, in, in anything they can communicate about where voters are on this? Well, I mean, one of the nice things is you can talk about this in the language that elected officials sort of understand, and it fits in the Democratic and Republican value sets. But that is something that I think both Republicans and Democrats will be very interested in, in places like Texas, in places like Florida, even in places like the Midwest, is the, the gains that Republicans made with working class voters of color and trying to have a conversation with them that will, you know, help them pick those voters up and they're gonna be interested in how to do that. And the idea of sort of a, an economic boost for voters who have been most affected by this re recession will be an interesting one to them. And, and frankly, that'll be true of Democrats as well who are sort of eyeing the, the drop and concerned about it. But there will also be Democrats will be looking at white working class voters. We made gains with them this cycle. It wasn't all suburban and we, you, you don't win Wisconsin and Michigan and Pennsylvania with just sort of suburban voters. And they're going to be interested in how do we keep and hold those voters and frankly, um, an accomplishment. That's the thing I sort of point to is this is something you can actually get something done on and all these people that won know they were able to go back to their district and say I got something done. I delivered on something. It wasn't partisan. That, that is the conversation that you really want to have with these people of being able to come back with a real accomplishment when the stimulus and all these other things are going to get held up in partisan bickering. All right, Brian, thanks so much for sharing your insights on what you saw during this election cycle. Um, so now I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Kermit Kaliba. Kermit is NSC's Managing Director for Policy and he's gonna talk about uh, what all these election results mean for the prospects of inclusive skills policy, not just the White House results, but down ballot as well. So Kermit. Yeah, thank you, Rachel. Um, yeah, really excited. Uh, it's great to hear uh, Brian talk about the role that skills played leading up to the 2020 election. And now uh, we'll talk a little bit about what the 2020 election means uh, for skills. So, um, so uh, obviously the place to start, the biggest change coming out of last week's election is that it looks like we're going to have a new presidential administration. We've got uh, President-elect Joe Biden and Vice President-elect Kamala Harris slated to take office in January of 2021. So that's obviously the biggest change coming out of this election. And I would say from a skills perspective, we probably couldn't be asked for better champions for the field. 
Uh, so President-elect Biden has long been an advocate for investing in the skills of U.S. workers and businesses. I'd say most notably uh, in his role as vice president, where he oversaw the Obama administration's comprehensive review of federal workforce programs back in 2014. And that culminated in the release of the landmark 2014 report, Ready to Work, Job-Driven Training and American Opportunity. And folks may remember that report. That report, which was time for release in coordination with the reauthorization of the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act, or WIOA, was a real step forward for our field. Uh, it highlighted a range of proven best practices, including industry partnerships, career pathways, apprenticeship, and other work-based learning strategies that NSC and our state and local partners have been advocating for for years, uh, and really stood as a champion for those issues and for those, for those strategies and those priorities. The other thing that was important about that report was that it sent a clear signal about the critical importance of skills training as part of our nation's economic recovery and growth strategies and put the weight of the White House behind that message. And I think that was the first time, at least in, in all the years that I've been working on skills policy, that we saw such a clear uh, championship of, of skills from a, from a White House. And we really appreciated that when that, when that came through. President-elect Biden made skills a key part of his campaign pitch in 2020. Uh, President-elect Biden, I should say. Among other things, uh, he called for $50 billion in new investments in workforce training, including investments that would build on the Obama administration's successful Apprenticeship USA initiative. Folks may remember that was an initiative to expand apprenticeship to new industries and new workers, including workers of color and women who have not always had a, an opportunity to participate in, uh, in, in, uh, in apprenticeship. Uh, Vice President -elect, uh, uh, President elect Biden also called for making two years of tuition free community college available to all qualifying students, including adult learners who uh, went out of his way to point out adult learners as a priority in this. Uh, and, he, and he called for investing in partnerships between businesses, community colleges, community based organizations, and other stakeholders, workforce boards that we know are necessary to expand pathways to opportunities. So, so uh, President elect Biden has really sort of sent a signal that he wants skills to be a part of his, his economic recovery and stimulus strategy. Now, Vice President elect Harris has also been a leader on skills in recent years, most notably through her introduction of the Skills for the 21st Century Act, which, amongst other things, would expand eligibility for what are known as individual training accounts under WIOA. It would significantly increase the amount of money that's available for training under WIOA, and importantly, would include an, an automatic mechanism for scaling up those investments in training in response to economic downturns like the one that we're currently experiencing. And I think we can all agree that it would have been a good thing if we'd had something in place like that uh, when, the, when the economic crisis hit back in, in February and March. So at NSC, we're excited about the opportunity to be working with the Biden and Harris administration. We specifically recommended that President-elect Biden create a new interagency task force on skills for inclusive economic recovery to help ensure that skills investments are a part of any future economic uh, stimulus and recovery efforts uh, that the administration may undertake, the new administration. Now, on the congressional side, uh, the outlook is a little bit less clear. Um, so it appears that Democrats were able to take control of the, or were able to retain control of the House. However, on the Senate side, Republicans currently are holding a lead of 50, to four, uh, 50 seats to 48 seats. And of course, we still have the two runoffs in Georgia that are pending. Um, the outcome of that, uh, those, those two uh, elections in Georgia are hugely consequential for what's going to be possible in the 117th Congress. So if Democrats are able to capture both of those seats, that will give them the majority in the Senate, uh, because they'll have 50 seats plus uh, Vice President Harris as a tiebreaker. And that would get, having the majority allow, does two big things. First, it would allow Democrats to have control over uh, the Senate committees, and it allows them to have uh, control over the, uh, the, 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 the agenda and what, what bills are able to make it to the floor on the Senate side. And, and that's really, really important uh, if for, from a de for Democrats if they're interested in advancing uh, progressive policies uh, to be able to set that agenda and be able to, to, to decide what reaches, what reaches the floor. The other thing that's, uh, that's important from a, for, for Democrats, uh, if they were to retain the majority or if they were to take the majority in the Senate, is it would allow the use of what's known as reconciliation, which is a, a budget tool that, uh, that can be used once every year uh, that allows for changes in federal spending without requiring the normal 60 votes required for Senate passage. Now, having reconciliation on the table as an option would give Democrats significant opportunities for new investments as part of an economic recovery package. Uh, and would really shape a lot of what uh, they might be able to accomplish right out of the right out of the gate if, uh, in the 117th Congress. On the other hand, if Republicans end up claiming one uh, or both of the Georgia seats in the Senate, that means that they will retain the majority, and they'll essentially have uh, they will be uh, able to make decisions about what's able to reach the floor on the Senate side. Now, 
that probably sounds like a recipe for gridlock, uh, right? So Democratic House, Republican Senate, uh, uh, and it could be. But we also think it creates some meaningful opportunities for bipartisan collaboration. We know that, uh, as, as Brian just said, skills are a bipartisan issue. And we think heading into the 2022 elections, both Democrats and Republicans are really going to be interested in being able to show uh, voters that they're that they're that Washington is taking the, the economic crisis seriously and is going to be looking to make sure that that and they're going to be looking to demonstrate to voters that they're they're doing something to make uh, to make sure that we're investing in workers and businesses to help pull us out of the this this recession. In fact, uh, Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell has already signaled his willingness to discuss uh, a new stimulus package to respond to the current crisis uh, before the end of the year. Um, and you know, this is uh, this is we don't we're not sure what's going to happen with that discussion, but this is the kind of opportunity that we as a field need to be weighing in on to make sure that our voices are heard and ensure that we're investing in workers as part of our economic recovery efforts. Now, looking ahead to the 117th Congress, which starts in January. Uh, we do actually see a couple of big opportunities for bipartisan collaboration on skills. So the most immediate opportunity that we see is around a federal infrastructure package. President-elect Biden has laid out an ambitious $2 trillion proposal for investments in a range of sectors, including surface transportation and transit, clean energy, broadband, and other sectors. And he signaled the importance of utilizing pre-apprenticeship models and project labor agreements, among other tools, to ensure that investments in communities hire and retain workers from those communities, especially workers of color. And that's critical because we know that every $1 trillion in infrastructure investments can mean as many as 11 million new jobs. And making sure that historically disadvantaged workers have access to those new jobs is a big part of what we see as an inclusive economic recovery. And now it's hard to say whether or not all of those proposals would make it through a divided Congress. We are optimistic that there's a lot of room for progress in this area. And I think there's a real openness to thinking about how do we make sure that infrastructure investments include investments in people? The other big opportunities that we see for next year are the Higher Education Act, which was last reauthorized in 2008, and then the Workforce in, uh, Innovation and Opportunity Act, which, uh, believe it or not, has actually been on the books now for almost seven years and, uh, and actually expired in September. So it's due for reauthorization. Hard to believe, right? So HEA uh, is important because it's the single largest federal investment in skills. It provides over $100 million in loans and grants to help students including working adults, get the credentials and degrees that they need to succeed in today's economy. NSC has called for modernizing the law to better reflect the needs of today's students, including working adults. So we've called for expanding access to financial aid for high quality occupational programs uh, at community colleges, uh, more funding for student supports to make sure that students have access to uh, childcare, transportation, and other supports that they need to be successful. We called for investments in partnerships between community colleges and industry and other stakeholders to make sure that we're helping people get the credentials they need to be successful. Congressional leaders actually got fairly close in this Congress to getting to an HEA reauthorization that included a number of those priorities. And we're pretty hopeful that they can pick up where they left off uh, and, and, and make HEA reauthorization a priority in this Congress. The other, I, I, on WIOA, so, um, you know, uh, we, as I said, WIOA just expired. It's still a relatively new law as, as federal legislation goes in that sense. Um, and so we know that states are still sort of, uh, sort of figuring out what, they're, what they're, they want to achieve with WIOA. But one of the things we know, and we particularly know in response to this crisis, is that the levels of investments under WIOA have simply not been what they need to be. And that's it's really been showcased and really real, uh, thrown in stark relief as part of this recession, as we've seen state and local workforce systems staggering under the weight of the historic unemployment rates that we've seen over the last six months that Andy just was referencing in his comments. So NSC is calling for a truly transformative reauthorization process when Congress comes back into Washington in, 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 20, in 2021 that boosts, significantly boosts investments in workers who've lost their jobs due to the pandemic or due to other factors, but also increase investments in upskilling for lower wage workers who need new skills and credentials in order to stay on the job. This is something we've seen is that there are a lot of workers that have, uh, in addition to all the workers who have lost their jobs and are going to need, need, need to look for new jobs, there are also a lot of workers who have needed to upskill in order to stay on the job and in order, to, in order to advance in their careers. We need to be thinking about how we're investing in all workers to make sure that we're competitive. We're also calling for reimagining how we measure success under WIOA. So we want, and, and all federal skills programs, and ensuring that we're using metrics that, that allow us to see whether the, whether we're meaningfully addressing equity gaps that are caused by structural racism and other barriers. So we're we're really calling on Congress to, to in addition to focusing on stimulus and recovery, 
to really be thinking about how our existing federal programs can be uh, leading to an inclusive economic recovery. And, and we're, we're looking forward to working with all the people on this call and all of our state and local partners across the country uh, to make this happen over the course of the next two years. And with that, let me, uh, let me, let me stop and turn things over to Rachel to uh, talk to some of our networks. All right, thanks, Kermit. A lot to think about. Um, so now I want to introduce the stars of our webinar. Um, you know, Andy mentioned at the beginning that it's going to take advocacy to move the proposals uh, in this agenda forward. Um, NSE has four networks that we're going to be supporting to mobilize and to advance this agenda. And we have folks here today who have been engaged with, with each of those networks. Uh, Gerard Melanson is the Vice Chancellor for Workforce Solutions at Baton Rouge Community College in Louisiana, and he's a member of NSC's Board of Directors, and he's been a leader in our national network of advocates who work to influence federal policy. We've also got Melinda Mack, who's the Executive Director of the New York Association of Employment and Training Professionals, also an NSC board member, and she leads one of the 25 state policy coalitions that are a part of our SkillSpan network. We also have Gerard Camacho here, who's the Assistant Vice President at Atrium Health, and he's been one of the most engaged leaders recently in our Business Leaders United network. Um, and finally, Corinne Eldridge, who's the president and CEO of the California Long-Term Care Education Center. Uh, Corinne's been an active member of the Skills for California campaign and has also helped bring the perspective of working people to our Voices for Skills network. So thank all of you for being here. Um, Gerard M., I'm going to start with you. So you actually received NSC's Skills Champion Award a couple years ago for your ag advocacy around federal policy. And that includes uh, more Hill briefings, fly-ins, meetings with members of Congress than I think any of us could count. Um, so obviously that's not necessarily your day job. So why have you put so much time into this advocacy? Well, Rachel, thank you so much. I'm going to give you a very short answer and, and, and a very little long, drawn out answer. But, um, but first of all, thank you for having me here. Um, it's a blessing working with you guys. And y'all have always found a way to help me celebrate November 12th, like I mentioned before. Y'all told me on November 12th, about two years, three years ago, that I was receiving the Skills Champion Award. Um, and uh, November 12th is my father's birthday. Um, who passed away about 20 years ago. That's the reason why I moved to Louisiana, is to spend the last six months of his life here in Louisiana. So November 12th is such a special day, and y'all always find a way to, one, cheer me up, but to also give me a good reason to celebrate his legacy. So uh, so thank you so much. The longer answer, the short answer of this, my dad always told me, Gerard, you can work very hard by yourself, digging a hole, but the only thing you're going to end up do is dig a ditch or dig a grave for yourself. But so you need to partner with others to actually get to a well or get to some type of resource of your efforts. National Skills Coalition believes in this uh, and primarily believes that power rests in relationships. And these relationships are very reciprocal with on the ground partners. I was introduced to y'all through my board work with NCWE, who represented about 700 local community technical college uh, workers. And, uh, and I felt so good about working with, this, with, with the, the, the National Skills Coalition staff because of the culture. Y'all had a culture of, of listening, learning, uh, thinking together, and had shared leadership on solutions um, that were really trying to help us all across the nation regarding our workforce challenges. These partnerships not only helped my personal work here in Baton Rouge and with my business partners and my community partners, these collective works have and will continue to strive to eliminate barriers for all disconnected, primarily black and brown people that who are working the hardest, lowest paid jobs in America. And really there's no clear way of that dead end situation. Also, we have built all types, of, you know, and, and the other thing is the breadth of diversity. You guys have built relationships um, with all types of uh, practitioners, community-based organizations, business partners, and all the way up to federal policy experts, which you already are, but you also partner with more policy experts too. Uh, that gives me more tools to build local on-ramps for my disconnected workers 
who I see every day. I also feel much better when I'm traveling across the floor to DC, the conference calls, knowing that I'm working with others um, to fight and build uh, local on-ramps for their communities. And we're giving tools for the person, you, everybody in 700 people saw today. And we know we, we're developing tools and solutions that get them out of that situation, that, they, that, that there's, there's hope and there's opportunities and pathways. And that's more than 700 people on this call fighting to do that every day. So that's, you know, that's why I, 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 I love doing this, whatever it is, because of, of those reasons. So thank you all more than anything. Well, thank you, Gerard. Um, so obviously you've been really effective in your advocacy and it's great to hear how it's benefited your work in Baton Rouge. Um, why is it in particular, imp particularly important for this to be an inclusive economic recovery? Um, and why is it important to the work you're doing for federal policies to be a partner on that? Okay, man, <laughs> COVID has taught us a lot especially what happens in society when we allow selfish people make very selfish decisions and how collectively we all suffer and die. We have too many people believing that our people, that people are disposable. Well, workforce is very similar. Now, we have to have individuals who are self-seeking excellence for their own better way of life. However, these individual efforts must be organized to make a meaningful impact for our industry sectors and for the demands for a better world. When this happens, these individual collective efforts will build resilient pathways for those workers who we see who are primarily black and brown people and others working in very non-resilient careers or I will say disposable jobs. Now, some of the things I know we kind of talked about some of the things that uh, we like I love to partner with on with National Skills Coalition and a lot of this is tied to the the, the policy initiative that, that are moved forward. Uh, I talked a lot about roads on ramps dead end streets and but I really like to talk about those opportunities that happen happen is a, a very effective infrastructure build out. But it would be nice to tie to that all the things that Andy has mentioned. Uh, and these are laser focused in, in, in many ways that it'd be great to see um, kind of, I say a contract to help grow the workforce with these large tr trillions of dollars are gonna go out when they have to do this. But it needs to be a guaranteed workforce experience that's tied into these contracts for these contracts to go out. Our people have to be exposed to these cutting edge civil works projects. And they like to have the teeth just as much of, of enforcement as David, uh, Davis Bacon, the prevailing wage acts are ingrained in these federal contracts. Obviously short term Pell or free community clinical colleges for meaningful programs that National Skills Coalition has championed for a very long time. But as mentioned before, school based funding for workforce and non credit programs are very important. Getting in the door is one thing, but if we don't have the tools of state of the art equipment and our instructors are not trained and retrained on this equipment and being exposed to new technologies, um, it, we're, we have a huge gap in the, in, in the learning cycle of building a, a 21st century workforce. We talked about incentives for industry and this very important big incentives and also tied to those incentives be something similar again, like I mentioned before for the infrastructure jobs, workforce experience for our new trainees to get experience to these uh, big incentives of energy efficiency, uh, lower water uses and so forth. And we mentioned this before about our workers. The work, the, 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 the framework of work has changed. We have a lot more gig workers, a lot of people I train outside of healthcare because all the hospitals need them and they need a permit. But a lot of these industry-based certification and, and work, they're highly skilled, they're highly paid, but it's short term on contracts. We need, we need to make sure they're supported you know, retirement plans to have a federal match of some sort, affordable, affordable health care and all other insurances at the table and also in gig workers, people need special mortgages and access to capital through rough times. So those those are some things I'm excited for uh, to work with y'all with the National Skills Coalition and uh, with the forthcoming Biden administration and uh, we and 700 people here today to make a, a meaningful impact 
of the hard work that we have to do moving forward. Thank you. Thanks, Gerard. Um, so, Melinda, I want to turn to you next. Um, as I said, you lead a state policy coalition that's part of NSC's skills span network. So I have two questions for you. Uh, why does federal policy matter to state policy and your efforts in New York around inclusive recovery? And, and why are skills span coalitions like yours going to be carving out time to talk to not just state policymakers, but federal policymakers? Sure. Thank you, Rachel. Um, it's always hard to follow someone like Gerard, by the way. Um, here's what I will say, and I think folks often forget about this when we're in the weeds on the ground doing advocacy work at the state level or even at the city level in New York City. Um, the buck stops with federal policy. The vast majority of the funding that comes to New York State is federal funding, whether it be TANF money, so the funding that supports the welfare system, CDBG money, uh, resources from the Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act, the Higher Education Act, the vast majority of the money and the policies that in many ways hamstring a lot of folks in terms of what they're able to do tend to start with the federal government. And so one of the, the things that we always do is we think about policy work is we try to figure out the origin of the problem. What is the pain point? Um, and very often it comes back to some of the federal issues that we need to address or shift or change. Um, I think it's been interesting over the last 20 years, whether it be on the welfare side or in the WIOA side, we sort of waver our way out of it, right? So we request a waiver, submit a waiver, figure out a way around um, the language or information that's in the federal legislation. But ultimately, the best pub public policy happens when it's inspired by the practice, by the field, right? And so networks like NIATEP um, and the work we do through the Invest in Skills New York um, group through the, the statewide coalition really are good and strong policy um, connectors because ultimately what happens on the ground that is the best practice makes its way into the public policy. And so again, our hope is that we influence city policy, state policy and federal policy. And ultimately there is enough flexibility for us to do what we know New Yorkers need, but also with the business community as well. Great, thanks so much, Melinda. Um, and and that is one of the things that we really love being engaged with here at NSC is that connection between local, state, and federal, and and feeding the information experiences um, up and down in that cycle. Um, so next, I want to turn to Gerard um, and talk about the business perspective. So Gerard, you've done a great job diversifying the pipeline of workers in healthcare. Why do industry leaders need Congress to be thinking about investing in skills training and supports, in particular now, to support an inclusive economic recovery, as opposed to waiting to make those investments once things are better? Absolutely. Hi, and good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, well, I think the first thing is that businesses cannot do this alone, right? Funders like JP Morgan Chase and, and you know the United Ways and, and other uh, philanthropic agencies have really supported the business effort in the past to go ahead and fund some of these workforce development initiatives to bring talent into the systems. Uh, but I think that in, in this unprecedented economic uncertainty and in these times, businesses are less capable of making these kind of investments, especially small and mid-sized businesses. Uh, and without help, we cannot do this and we cannot continue to bring the talent pipelines in that we need to fill those empty jobs or vacancies. For example, in the in the uh, in philanthropy, we really cannot fund this in perpetuity. Um, public investments in this kind of efforts will make our, uh, you know, our talent pipeline mobility, workforce uh, strategies more sustainable, equitable, and more help uh, and more effective. And they actually, they help broaden the talent pipeline for employers that need the talent right now. I think that one of the things in the healthcare sector, we have a very big uh, gap in terms of supply and demand, right? And there's a big need for labor and skilled workers to come in and help us with COVID right now. There's a lot of increase in testing, screening, in operations. Um, there's a lot more patients coming in and we're at capacity. So the ability to upscale workers that may perhaps be displaced by the economy is key to not only the recovery of our system and the way that we provide a service to the community, but the ability to bring individuals into healthcare careers. But again, we cannot do this alone. And uh, I think that's very important and critical for us to work with communities and community leaders to make sure that we're advocating 
for meaningful policy changes, for meaningful activities that can bring about actual um, philanthropic and non-philanthropic uh, revenue in to help support these efforts. It requires a lot of capital to do a rapid injection of uh, an upskilling and training for capacitating individuals to come into the healthcare sector. And we need something that will be more long-term plan solutions that are more sustainable. All right, Jared, thanks. That rings true, I think, for a lot of folks. Um, so can you talk about what Business Leaders United has done already to get Congress ready to act on some of these inclusive economic recovery principles and also why it was important for your company to have you take part in those Business Leader United efforts. Certainly, I think that the experience with Business Leaders United on the Hill is a great example. Uh, there was about 130 business uh, uh, leaders that met with more than 70 legislative officers to make sure that workforce investments and reforms were a critical part of our economic recovery. And uh, I, we did a fly in one day and we met with, uh, uh, le uh, with legislative officers to have these discussions. And that has continued throughout the year. So the ability to be connected with Business Leaders United on the Hill uh, with, with this uh, uh, a really great agency is the ability to continue those conversations even with our local officials. For example, we had a conversation with Senator Scott a couple of weeks ago for a senator from South Carolina to bring about how do we do income mobility strategy, Title I schools into healthcare careers, who uh, has really provide intelligent conversations about what are the particular issues that we can help voice out. How do we stay connected with one another as business leaders, uh, echoing this same uh, kind of messages to our uh, policymakers. So it's been incredibly effective and it's, it's meaningful for us because like I said before, we need to really have that level of conversation with the leaders because we are the employers we are the ones that are bringing the skill and the talent into our facilities to be hired, to have those family sustaining wages, but without the support of our local officials for, from federal government and policy, from funding, from things like that, the companies cannot do this alone. We need the support of our, our, our really just policy behind this to make sure that we have all what we need to bring those individuals into our systems, into family sustaining level wages and healthcare careers. And BLU has been a, a great, great way to do that. Great, thanks so much, Gerard. Now, Corinne, I wanna to turn to you for the labor perspective. Um, so you have a partnership with SEIU, of course, and you're advancing people in union jobs um, in the healthcare field by building their skills. So can you share with folks, how has the recession impacted your field and why do you need policymakers to be a partner to you in building towards an inclusive recovery in California? Absolutely. Thank you, Rachel. It's really a pleasure to be here today. So we train long-term care workers, both in-home caregivers and nursing home caregivers, who, as you stated, are members of SEIU Local 2015 in California. As we knew before the pandemic, and this has certainly been exemplified during, they're both essential workers and first responders. With that context, we haven't seen a fallout from the recession as their labor and knowledge is needed more than ever to keep our most vulnerable safe. Long-term care is one of, if not the fastest growing occupations. There are over half a million long-term care workers in California with a projected need of 1.4 million caregivers across the nation by 2026 and an existing shortage. Home care and nursing home workers are predominantly women and women of color whose first language is one other than English. And so historically, they have been in the crosshairs of both systemic racism and systemic sexism, where the essential work they do to keep seniors and people with disabilities safe, it hasn't been invested in. The wages are just above minimum wage. Not everyone receives benefits and the work that they do is not seen as valuable. As we build and deliver our training program, our impact studies show that by training, we improve care and we improve retention of the workforce. Yet based on the way funding for training of workers is accessed, 
federal and state trending, federal, excuse me, federal and state funding to train long-term care workers rarely exists, cutting short access to skills and career pathway opportunities. When we think about the future of building an inclusive economy, excuse me, an inclusive recovery, to take the phrase from President-elect Biden, we do need to build back better. There is a fundamental shift that needs to happen by acknowledging that there has been historic disinvestment in black and brown communities, and that is magnified if you're a woman. So as policymakers are looking for the framework and the path forward, there's a moral imperative to invest in people and communities that have been left out, to invest in programs that acknowledge the history of racial and gender stereotypes. It's an opportunity to invest in women and minority women, shifting the way funding is accessed and build training to support skill gain and career pathways, particularly in the long-term care sector. There are a lot of workers who weren't doing well before the recession, and there is an opportunity to do better, but we need to acknowledge the past first. Being inclusive means building recovery that is centered around racial and gender equity and allows people to be respected for the essential work that they do in measurable ways that have wages and training opportunities that are commensurate with the value of work that they bring. Great, thanks, Karen. Um, so I know you have partnered with folks uh, on our Voices for Skills campaign to share the stories of individuals in the long-term uh, healthcare sector. Why do folks in DC who are shaping policy need to be reaching out to and listening to the voices of workers themselves? Well, it's been incredible to partner with NSC on the Voices for Skills campaign. One of our CNA graduates, Brenda Macias, was able to tell her story as to why training was important to her, not just to advance her career, but to feel more empowered in her life and to gain the confidence to see that so much more is possible. The workers we train, just like workers all over this country, have wisdom to share. They speak their own truth. Workers know what is happening on the job, the details of it, what could improve their day-to-day -day work, what could hinder it. They can articulate industry needs, talk about what job trainings could be helpful, lay the pathway for success, and also understand what could get in the way of that success. They have personal lived experiences that share and shape their everyday choices, both on and off the job. And their voices really bring in another perspective, helping to balance the equation and ensure it's not just top down, but that voices from different levels are part of the equation. Also, when workers of the same industry hear that one of their coworkers was part of the conversation, they're much more likely to have deeper respect for the solutions that are being offered. So buy-in happens in a much different way. As each of us speaks with policymakers, it's crucial to include the voices and the real voices of workers. Where possible, bring workers with you, or in this time, have them on Zoom calls to tell their short stories and share their experience. When we write papers that include data, elevate the voices and experience of the workers. Data tells one side of the story and the real life experience of the worker in combination with the data gives a much fuller picture. And I think policy makers really want to hear from workers. They bring that real world context and can talk to any support that's needed for success. They also bring ideas, ideas that you or I may not be thinking of. The agency that they bring brings greater investment in the outcomes, both the current and the future state. And lastly, if members of your workforce come from language groups other than English, invest in an interpreter so their words can be spoken and heard and understood. This really allows for accurate representation and voices and wisdom being heard. Worker voice is really a crucial piece in the foundation of shaping policy. Fran, thanks so much. And we're looking forward to working with you more on the Voices for Skills campaign. Um, so I want to thank all of our panelists uh, for everything you're obviously already doing and everything you're going to be doing to ensure that we're able to actually build back better by ensuring this recovery is inclusive of the workers and businesses who are hit hardest by this recession. Um, 
I want to make sure folks on this call know how they can get involved with this advocacy um, and these four networks. And so I'm going to turn it over to Andy to close us out and share what each one of you can do um, to help us with this work in the coming days of making this agenda real. Thanks, Rachel. Um, first, I, for, I just want to just thank all the NSC staff, the NSC members and allies who are on this uh, call today, particularly Gerard and Gerard and Melinda and Corinne. Uh, we really appreciate it because we know that you're doing the work on the ground, uh, but your willingness to kind of be part of these conversations in Washington, even virtually, is just incredibly important. And you're a model that we all want. We want everybody who's on this call today to kind of recognize that there's something that all of us can be doing to be part of these conversations. I also want to thank Brian. Brian, thanks. You know, we need your information to help us remember that these are issues that we can talk about with Democrats and Republicans and independents. We should not lose sight of that. We have a chance to win on some of these things, but it's not going to just happen. We really are going to have to work on it. We're going to, have to bring all of our resources and members and networks together to make that happen. Um, and I will say, listen, we work with a lot of great national partners in Washington and we'll be doing that in the next several months. Uh, the thing that I always feel great about from National Skills Coalition's perspective is kind of what you saw on this call today. We have stakeholders from a wide range of perspectives that are coming together. They bring different ideas, they bring different priorities, but they all have this common vision that we need to move the conversation in Washington to start investing in people in a much more significant way than we've historically done. And to make sure that we're doing it, particularly for those who are struggling the most and who've been most impacted by this current recession. So two things that I wanted to put on as a headline that we're gonna follow up with you all about. One is, uh, I want you to think about the fact that between now and February, President Biden and then President Biden is going to be giving an address, a joint address, a joint address to Congress. Um, we want him talking about these issues as part of how it is that he's shaping what his recovery plan is moving forward for next year. Um, we've talked a little bit about that there's going to be maybe a stimulus package before the end of this year, but likely we're going to be looking to next year, an infrastructure proposal, a set of things, as well as those reauthorizations that Kermit was talking about. We need to make sure in the next two to three months that we've brought everybody on this call and everybody that you know into these conversations so that folks in Washington know that this has to be part of the plan moving forward for economic recovery. So two things that we're going to ask you to do. One is next week, you're going, everybody on this call is going to get a petition that we're going to send out to all of you. We need you to sign it. We need you to share it with all the businesses and the organizations that you work with to sign it, calling on the Biden administration and Congress to invest in people as part of this economic recovery. There's going to be a lot of folks who are going to be trying to influence what Washington is going to be talking about over the next two to three months. We need thousands of you. So that means you and 10 other people that you know to be on, uh, on that petition to make sure that that is getting to Washington so that they see that. So that's just kind of like our opening bid. Second, there's a lot of you who have come joined us every February for our Skills Summit in Washington, DC. Um, it's unfortunate that we're not gonna be bringing folks into a hotel for the next, you know, for two days and getting on a flight and whatever, but we can't not talk to members of Congress. And so also in the next week, you're going to start to hear from NSC staff about how all of you can be involved in virtual meetings that we're going to be having with members of Congress now and into the beginning of next year. We've got a goal that we want to have 2,500 engagements up on the hill between folks like yourselves that are doing this work and the folks who are going to be making a decision about what the economic recovery package is going to be looking like coming out of Congress next year. So again, Sit tight, look for information on that. Thank you in advance for your willingness to put in the time to share what it is that you're doing with working folks, to share what it is that you're doing with local businesses and industry partners on these issues and why it is that we need a more effective partner in Washington to help that work scale so that we can help more of the people who have been impacted by this pandemic. So I need you to do those two things. Look for information from us. I will also say that I know that there's a lot of folks who have been putting questions in the chat. And normally, listen, we like to have a back and forth with everybody. So I'm just going to ask if somebody on the NSC staff could at least like to make a copy of that. And we will try to follow up with folks on those particular questions. But you should always know if you've got an idea, you've got a question, reach out to us on the NSC staff. We value your input. That's what makes this organization tick, is that we're taking the best ideas from the ground and figuring out how we can bring it into policy conversations, both in Washington, D.C., and in state capitals all over the country. So 
look for that petition, look for the invite to be part of some virtual meetings with members of Congress. Give us your feedback to this, uh, to this event. Share this event, which is being recorded with people who weren't able to make it with us today so they can kind of get up to speed. Read those recommendations that we posted in the chat and that we'll be sending out to you again. And I'm just really looking forward to working with you on these issues over the next few months so that come February, we're gonna see that your work has had an impact on decisions that are being made in Washington and that we really are gonna be moving towards some kind of more inclusive economic recovery coming out of this recession. So thanks everybody. We're looking forward to being back in touch with all of you in a lot of different ways over the next couple of months.